Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. Um, I am recording tonight's program. I will send all of you a link once I've posted it to our YouTube channel so you can watch it again or share it with others. I'd like to thank the foundation for supporting all of the programming at Cary Library and thank you to everyone who's made a donation to that organization. I'd also like to thank GWAC, the Global Warming Action Committee for partnering with us on tonight's event specifically. You may have noticed that there are subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Zoom has recently enabled closed captioning, which many people find helpful. You can disable that by clicking on the upward arrow next to the live transcript button and choose hide subtitles. Tonight's program will be a bit of a mixed format. We will begin with a presentation by Dr. Ray Andre, author of Lead for the Planet, Five Practices for Confronting Climate Change. <clears throat> to ask questions. To ask a question, please either type it into the chat button at any time or unmute yourself and wait for me to call on you just so we don't have people talking over each other. After the Q&A, we are going to move into small breakout rooms for a more engaged discussion. And then we'll come back to this main room for a recap of those conversations and more Q&A if there's an interest in that. Please know that I am only recording this main room. The breakout rooms are not recorded. <clears throat> so feel free to have an honest and open discussion in there. I will give you additional instructions on breakout rooms right before we go into them. So on to our speaker. Dr. Ray Andre is an organizational psychologist who consults internationally on teaching climate leadership. She is Professor Emeritus of Leadership and Sustainability in the Damore McKim School of Business at Northeastern University. Lead for the Planet has been long listed for Management Book of the Year 2021 by the UK's 143,000 member Chartered Management Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome Ray and to turn things over to her. Thank you, Christine. So the first thing we need to do is share my screen, right? Yes. That's Perfect. Working. Yep. Okay. Get rid of myself. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm so pleased to see so many friends and, and uh, climate activists and people who are interested in trying, trying to solve the climate crisis. Specifically tonight, we're gonna talk about how team humanity can address the climate crisis. We're all members of Team Humanity and working together, we have to get this done. But like all teams, we have both strengths and weaknesses and um, strengths and weaknesses as decision makers. And so we need to understand those strengths and weaknesses and we need leaders who can help us to minimize our weaknesses and build on our strengths. This is very common. You may need to use the play buttons in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. The play over, one, oh, over one more. Left. Well, it's my left. <laughs> is that right? That one there? Nope. Two over. Um, there's two arrows, one pointing in opposite directions. There you go. That one. Nope. The other one. There you go. Oh, okay. So that's how I have to. Um, that's change. how you'll advance it. Yep. That's the only way. I think so. Okay, uh, thank you. So I wanna dedicate this uh, presentation to my beautiful daughter, Megan, and uh, to the thought leaders who have encouraged us all to build our families through adoption. Christine uh, invited me to talk a little bit about uh, my, myself as a writer, because uh, I know that there's so many writers uh, out there in the audience tonight, and uh, perhaps that will be of some interest to you. Um, I, I like to write books that solve problems and I've always done that. And I have done it with a philosophy that real people lead interdisciplinary lives. So much of academia is very narrow in <clears throat> what, it, what it produces. Uh, I've tried to be the opposite, I've tried to be broad. And I've always, I've always worked that way and uh, it's probably personality driven. Some of you may remember uh, back uh, around the early 2000s that 
here in Lexington, we had a major issue of uh, Hanscom Field expanding with uh, community, um, uh, with uh, aviation um, uh, <laughs> uh, commercial aviation is what I'm trying to say. And uh, I was a part of that in a, mod in a modest way, but I also wrote a book about it, uh, Take Back the Sky, Protecting Communities in the Path of Aviation Expansion. And that book was my first environmental writing project. And it got me very interested in pursuing more uh, environmental work. So uh, subsequently to that, I, I went on to write other books, but I also began to develop an interest in the environment. I attended a wonderful program at Cornell University uh, one summer, an intensive one week um, in terms of um, studying what, are, what, is the, what is the status of the planet? Uh, how, how are we doing? And the news wasn't good. And that was back in 2004. Building on that, I then spent uh, over a decade teaching uh, leadership and sustainability at Northeastern in both the business school and across the curriculum with the honors students. So I've been studying this for a very long time. and. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's so worthwhile. I, I love to be able to do whatever I can to contribute to solving the climate problem. So my new book, uh, uh, Lead for the Planet, offers a model of, of what leaders need to know uh, about climate and leadership practice. And it's designed to start conversations. So uh, it's the first book published by the University of Toronto's new trade imprint, and so is designed for both academic and popular audiences. On my website, you can find many teaching materials that support the book, videos, exercises, syllabi, uh, and experiential learning philosophy, anything that, that supports the kind of conversations that we're having today. So my main message is, uh, is laid out for you, for you here. Um, team humanity must act fast to minimize global warming. Most of you probably are very much aware of that. Team humanity needs leaders to get this done. And those leaders need to be prepared. And thus I have a uh, subtitle is five practices for confronting climate change. So to confront climate change, we must first confront team humanity's strengths and weaknesses as decision makers. So often when I read articles and, and watch films, I see a lot of uh, science, 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 80% of a, a presentation might be science and 20% might be what we should do about it. And sometimes the, the knee jerk default is simply, we really need to cooperate better to get this job done. Well, I'm here to say that that's not enough. We need to do more. We need to figure out what that cooperation looks like. And that's what my, my writing is about. So I take a look at the social science um, and uh, uh, the social science suggests that our ability to cooperate is really quite limited. We have cognitive biases, we're tribal, we don't trust each other and a whole host of other you know, annoyances that make us uh, human and therefore <laughs> weak. Um, so uh, my main message concludes with, therefore, we really should look at another side of our, our personalities, which is that we have talents to be creative, adventurous, competitive, um, and therefore, uh, building on that, what we should be doing is really doing a lot more with public and private support for innovation. I wanna say that I didn't start out um, looking to, to create policy. I look, I started out to create a book of five practices that would help leaders to be better at addressing the climate. But I came away and I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna walk you through that logic and you're, you're gonna have the opportunity to discuss and critique that in your, in your uh, breakout rooms. Uh, the idea that we really need to stop, stop imagining that cooperation is gonna solve this problem and start imagining that uh, innovation might. So our agenda tonight is that we first got this little lecture by me. I'm gonna look at the five practices and we're gonna do that interactively. I'm gonna be asking you questions during, uh, during that time, uh, uh, quiz questions. Uh, and then we're gonna take a look at what the social science suggests about human decision-making. As I wrote the book, every time I, I created a practice or you know, conceptualized a practice, I took a look at what social science was saying about the things in that practice. And that's, I will, that'll be the second part of my presentation tonight. Then we're gonna do questions, breakout room and uh, discussion. 
So we all know we're in trouble. And um, <laughs> so uh, here is Hurricane Florence, which dropped uh, record-breaking waters on the southeastern United States. Um, here is most recent fires in California and the uh, 1200, uh, I, you know, my, my screen is not working the way I want it to, but I believe uh, it's 1200 a mile plume of smoke. I just, uh, 1200 is being covered uh, in my screen. So um, we also most recently were visited by the polar vortex. I love this graphic. Uh, he, the polar vortex will get you if you don't watch out. And so we really have to um, set some goals for ourselves. And the goals are, first of all, to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Uh, and second, to create a clean energy future. And crucially, we need to do it through democratic processes. I am not gonna spend much time talking about democratic processes tonight because I think you know what they are and what needs to be done. Uh, and we, uh, you know, and we really need to get that done, but it's just not part of what we're gonna talk about here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a few folks were kind enough to say some words about my book and emphasize the, the leadership aspects of it. So this is Richard Heinberg, uh, who is uh, author of the famous book, The End of Growth. And he says, quote, uh, by the way, all of the um, uh, italicized texts are direct quotes throughout the presentation. So he says uh, about our need for leaders, while the current climate movement leadership deserves thanks, the results it has achieved have been paltry compared to the scope of the action needed. And I agree with that. And a new generation of leaders is required that is more numerous, informed, courageous, and skilled. Bill McKibben, the favorite son of our uh, Lexington has said, Basically, we need all the good thinking we can get if we're gonna make progress fast. And we, we have a lot of leaders, but we, we really have to think harder. <clears throat> so the five practices um, are things that, they're, a practice is a group of ideas, facts, theories, and strategies that can drive policies and actions toward Team Humanity's climate goals. Uh, five practices seem to work out pretty well in terms of uh, giving, giving my students and, and you folks who are readers a, 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 something to hang your, your ideas on and say, well, you know, I've mastered this practice. I know a lot about, for example, risk management, but maybe I don't so, know so much about what companies are doing internally. Um, and again, I support the five practices with uh, the social science and informed reasoning uh, to help guide leaders' decisions. So the logic of the five practices as it goes through the book is first of all, get the truth. What is the truth? How do you imagine the truth? And then based on that, uh, what, what are the risks, both to you, your family, your company, and to the planet? Uh, who are the stakeholders? The good guys, the bad guys, the, you know, the green guys, the brown guys, uh, and how are they going to compete in this arena? What is business's role and, um, uh, how are companies addressing climate change? And finally, uh, who on the global scale is really going to, to get this done and what are they going to do? So I'm, I wanna spend a little time going through the five practices before we then go to the social science and, and, and how that's interpreted. Um, so practice, and, and you know, the book is very dense, but it's very short. It's about 200 pages with a million footnotes. I'm never going to write a book like that again. Um, tired of tired of doing all that all that stuff. Um, but I'm, I want to give you some of the highlights of each of the practices so you can get a flavor for what's in there. So practice one is to get the truth. So to lead with confidence, it's very important for you to know where your own truth comes from, and it comes from macro factors like how people per perceive truth intellectually and emotionally. And it also comes from macro factors like who controls the media. Um, so you need to know that to develop your own confidence, you know, why do I believe this thing? Uh, and then also to persuade others, you need to understand where their truth comes from. Some people haven't had the advantage of, um, of um, 
significant educational experiences, for example, where do they get their truth? And to persuade them, you're gonna to need to know that. So in order to, uh, some of the things you learn in this chapter is how to be an effective lay reader of science, how to get access to science. Surprisingly, uh, we academics think, oh yeah, just go on to the library and you get it. Well, outside of academia, uh, articles cost money. And how do, you, how do you even begin to get the science that you need if you're not already um, tuned into a particular institution? Um, and then you, one of the decisions that companies have to make is whether to make or buy the science. Are we gonna create the science in our own, um, in our own uh, institution? Or are we gonna hire consultants to do it for us? So one of the things I like to do is to quiz my, sci my students. So I'm gonna um, quiz you guys a little bit uh, torture you, if you will. I love doing it. It's so much fun. Um, and so one of the things you want to do is become an effective lay reader of science. That's one of the goals of this practice. So here's a little test for you. The average global temperature on earth has increased by somewhat more than one degree Celsius since 1880. How much is that in Fahrenheit? And you can throw an answer in chat, or I think it's casual enough. Oh, we already have an answer. Dan says 1.8. Well, that's one answer. Are there any other answers? <laughs> Anybody brave? No. Okay. That's okay. Don't, you don't need to put your answer in here. Imagine this is going to be on the internet <laughs> for, for everybody to see. Um, Okay, so this is a question for we Americans who were raised in the Fahrenheit era, and we are pretty ignorant, generally speaking. A lot of my students struggle with this, and I'm honestly, when I started out, I'm not sure I would have gotten this answer correct either. The answer is 1.8 Fahrenheit, but some of you are struggling with, what about the 32 and the degrees and all that? I'm gonna let you look at this later. I'm not going to explain it right now, but you know, the answer is 1.8 because we're only comparing degrees. We're not comparing scales to make a long story short. Um, here's another one. Uh, what is your sense of truth is um, maybe exemplified in this, in this case. Uh, so an energy company has just discovered a shale play that may yield 3 billion barrels of oil. At current rates of world consumption, how long will this much oil last the world? So now think about this one, and I'd love to see some answers in the chat. I can't see the chat right now, but... Um, <clears throat> I will read it to you as answers come in. Oh, delightful. <laughs> it may take people a few minutes. People, oh, a few minutes. No fair Googling it. That's not fair. Okay, the point, the point being is, to be a good reader, um, you have, need to have a few little facts in your head. Like if I'm reading one Celsius and I really don't really have a good feeling for that, I need to know that's 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit and it's two degrees, it's 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that maybe feels a lot warmer than one degree Celsius, okay? So, um, so this energy company has 3 billion barrels of oil. Do we have, so Christine, do you have some answers? We have a couple answers. Um, we have four, a week or two, a day, three months, one month. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, so the answer is uh, the world uses about 100 million barrels of oil every day, a little bit less right now, but that's a good number. And you divide 3 billion by 100,000 and you get one month. And, you know, how does that feel to you? Does, you know, when, when somebody says, well, we, we found 3 billion barrels. Usually people go, oh, wow, that's a lot. And then just walk away. But <clears throat> when you understand how little that, how little that lasts, uh, you have a different sense of how little oil is really left in the world. And one of the things I have my students do is go on a, a, an oil hunt. And they usually find out that there's maybe 50, 50, maybe 60 years of oil left at the current usage. And that in itself is a factor, a major factor in how we perceive the truth about the energy picture today. I was very, very pleased at one point to hear that a, uh, one of the governors of one of the southeastern states who were facing uh, drilling, and they were voting to, to, to fight the drill, oil drilling off the coast of their states, who, who say, made some comment like, uh, wow, um, uh, you know, I'll be damned if I'm gonna I'm gonna give up my beaches 
for you know three weeks of oil or, or whatever it was and, and you know good for him and and good for all the people that you know have this in this sense of of how much oil there is left in the world um and and let that drive your your decision making okay practice two is assess the risks based on what you know from practice one so in this in this practice, we understand the psychology of risk, you know, which com is comprised mainly of dread or fear and familiarity. How much do you know the risk that you're you're looking at? Uh, how much do you know about it? And then there's you know all kinds of biases and other things that go into it. Um, you know, it's it's interesting to know, and I think if you're going to be a leader, really really get into this issue. You need to know how the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change measures and reports risk. Uh, and so on. One of the problems is that corporations, you see danger signal down there, uh, corporations tend to frame risk management as business of use, as usual. So if we can just think about the risk and manage it and, and you know, make some actions uh, towards solving it, um, they lose a sense of, I think, the rapid change in climate that we're experiencing and the dangers that that poses. So here's a question on dread risk. In other words, how fearful does this make you? The climate is changing at a pace that's far faster than anything seen in how many years? What do you think? You can type that into the chat without fear. What's no answers yet. Oh, here we go, a couple. Um, everybody's picking A. Oh, one B. Oh, a B. Well, well, you know, we have a pretty educated audience out here. I, I have a suspicion. Uh, and it is, yeah, 65 million years. So the climate's changing at a pace that's far faster than anything's left and then in 65 million years. I hope that scares you. Um, assessing climate risk. Here's another one. This is really easy for Lexington audiences. Throughout history until 20, uh, 200 years ago, the Earth's atmosphere contained 270 parts per million of CO2. What do scientists believe is a safe upper limit? Answers? None yet. I'm watching. Let's see. C. Anybody else do something else? I'd be surprised. So, so Bill McKibben founded 350.org and uh, based on what some people at that time thought was a uh, a deep and upper limit, and uh, it, it's not a bad idea, but nobody really knows. Um, and so, uh, it's it's not a bad goal. So um, assessing climate risk locally, uh, where are the temperatures increasing the most? We have one D, one E, a couple of Ds. Mostly Ds, one E. Such a good audience. I mean, you know, you don't even need to read my book. <laughs> so um, the answer is at the polls. Now, this is a kind of a watershed question in my, in my experience. If my students can't answer this question, then I do send them back to the science. I say, look, you know, you, you know, go to some of the NASA websites and so on and learn more about, uh, about climate because you know, there is a certain amount to know about climate that, that is very useful. Um, to me, I, I sometimes, and I, I sometimes get overwhelmed by climate information coming at me all the time. You know, the, the North American um, AMOC, uh, North American man, oh, overturning circulation um, is slowing down and it's slowing down 15%. And then, you know, more and more and more details. And sometimes it gets overwhelming. And, and what I do and what I tell my students to do is to always go back to the Keeling curve. The Keeling curve is the bottom line. This is the uh, measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere in parts per million at uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And I, you know, I think of it as one-stop shopping on the condition of the planet. And you'll see it's going up, up, up. And um, even under COVID, it went down a little tiny bit. So, so you know, one of those little blips itself might have gone down five percent or ten percent. I've seen depending on the on the measure and the place. But um, uh, I did read today that the CO two uh, from December of 2020 was more 
than December 2019. So and at any rate, it's it's going on up. And here, here's the Keeling curve um, laid on to the CO2 historically going all the way back to 800,000 years ago. Uh, so you can see, this is the very scary um, hockey stick thing that you've seen. So then, you know, what is the risk? Um, in February, this, this month, last month, uh, CO2 reached 416 parts per million. Remember that 350 was considered the, the most we should have. Um, at 450, the global average temperature will likely reach two degrees Celsius and bring all the uh, dire events that, that people think that's going to create. And we're scheduled to hit that about 2037. Practice three, weigh the stakes. It's got the fewest bullet points, but it's probably the most complex chapter. Uh, essentially, what you're looking at is you know, the stakes and the conflicts among um, business, government, and civil society, and especially among the energy sectors. And it's an attempt to weigh businesses impact on the environment against government's responsibility to protect it. Uh, uh, so, you know, again, it's very hard for me to capture that entire practice in one place, but here's just a sample of the kinds of knowledge that it might be useful to have if you're really considering sectors. I mean, for one thing, you need to know where fracking is going to happen in the United States and, and elsewhere for ma that matter. For example, can it be done in England? And um, uh, what about the tar sands in Canada? And where are the tar sands in Canada? And where are the jobs in Canada? And where are the pipelines? And so on. So there's all these details that one can absorb uh, from your general knowledge and then kind of put them together in terms of what, where are the main battlegrounds in the, in the, um, uh, among the stakeholders. But this one's fun, which is to you know, try it sometime, draw a map of the Arctic Ocean and label the countries that border it, just to give you a sense of feel, yourself a, sen a sense of the feel for, for example, uh, it's predicted that by 2050, the um, uh, Arctic Ocean will be ice-free in the summer. And people are salivating over prospects for looking for oil, although it's still going to be almost you know, very, very difficult, uh, and having shipping lanes uh, up there. And then who's going to control that? The Russians, the Chinese, us, who knows? Um, practice four is define the business of business. And business has lots of leverage points for improving its environmental impact. Um, I would say that the, the most important concept in this practice is the notion of weak sustainability versus strong sustainability. Some businesses uh, are pr uh, promoting sustainability strictly for their organization so that they can do things more cheaply, uh, more reliably, uh, more predictably uh, in the future. Other organizations are, are looking to try to really contribute to sustainability for the planet. And this is a very important practice for people who are beginning their careers and, and or moving jobs, it's important to assess your company's culture because if you don't have a cultural fit, you will face a burnout essentially. So it's important for you to understand really where is your company on the spectrum of weak sustainability to strong sustainability? And can you tolerate working for a company that is um, pursuing weak sustainability if you have strong sustainability views? And as you all know, increasingly young people have strong sustainability views. They really wanna get this done. Uh, an interesting set of research is what percentage of business schools are teaching strong sustainability? We wanna give me an estimate what percent of business schools are teaching strong sustainability? First answer in chat was 1%. Oh. 10%. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna guess two. Uh, 25%, less than 1%. 25% uh, wins it. So, 25, wow. Uh, well, you know, in a sample of 80 courses in 51 business schools, 29% used readings based on strong sustainability. Now, uh, at the top of this slide, I've given you some definitions of what strong sustainability you know, means uh, in terms of natural capital is priceless, growth is finite, 
and we should measure development using both economic and well-being factors. So th that's basically the strong sustainability paradigm for the planet. Um, Landrum, Nancy Landstrom and Ashowski, uh, uh, Nancy is just retiring from Loyola, Chicago, um, and she's done a lot of research. 29% used readings based in strong sustainability. Um, at the same time in the same study, uh, she also found that most sustainability courses are electives. So if they found a course, it, it doesn't mean that 29% of all the courses in the business school were you know, based in strong sustainability. So I, I, I don't think that your um, estimates of one, two, and 10 are necessarily wrong. In fact, nobody really knows. And it, hopefully it's changing. But honestly, uh, in terms of who invites me to speak and who is interested in my work, it's mainly religious schools, mission-driven schools, and um, liberal arts schools. It's not business schools. So um, engage global leadership, um, practice five. Here we talk about some of the solutions and uh, such as cap and trade, fossil fuel rationing um, and changing capitalism so that it's, it's more um, oriented towards understanding the importance of natural capital and so on. And um, uh, this is the chapter in which I begin to think, to look back and say, you know, does team uh, humanity really have the ability to cooperate uh, or not? Finally, um, my final summary chapter is something called what's the plan? And it, any successful plan has vision, goals, resources, an implementation strategy and accountability strategy, and then follow through with leadership. The Kyoto Accords some years ago uh, on CO2 was a plan. It was actually followed some of this and it had accountability. Uh, so that countries that had uh, went above their emissions allotment were actually penalized. They were, had to pay, pay actual money. And as soon as people came up to the deadline where they would actually have to pay money, countries came up to those deadlines, they, they pulled out. So Kyoto mainly failed. Paris, um, the famous accords that we're constantly talking about, is really only about talk. It gets people talking, but it is not a plan. And one of the problems that things that worries me about Paris is that the average person on the street thinks, oh, those guys are figuring this out and they think it really is a plan. Um, I think people are motivated by plans that add up, and, you know, in the old saying, think global and act local, uh, but they want to see how they add up. And some plans actually kind of, some people uh, propose that their plans add up, but they don't really. So. Um, a, a couple of them that I, I highly recommend if this topic interests you um, is, first of all, this, uh, the late David McKay uh, did this wonderful book and it's, you know, it's full of British humor and, um, it, uh, but offers hard truths about what a plan to add up for the, the world actually looks like. And uh, he, he gets into the nitty gritty of, um, uh, gigawatts and kilowatt hours and how many kilowatt hours Americans are gonna to have to give up in order to support uh, Southern countries that are poor and so on. Excellent book, but unfortunately, and it's free online, but unfortunately it's outdated. So if there's some brilliant person out there in our audience um, who would like to update that book, I think the world would, would really like to see it. Um, I noticed that uh, Bill Gates in his recent book on, on climate has mentioned McKay a couple times. The other place that's a, 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 um, a plan that does add up is the En-ROAD simulation. This is also free online and it's a lot of fun to work with. Uh, it sets out 18 energy related goals and uh, it's designed to build discussions in communities, companies and so on. Um, as, and, and a lot of times those discussions uh, work around um, which ones team humanity will be likely to implement. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the En-ROAD simulation is not exactly optimistic. Uh, people work with it. They, you can go and you can play with all the different variables uh, in very complex ways. Uh, and, but it can be very discouraging uh, to, to do that. So, um, 
So that's the five practices and, um, and what it all adds up to. And now I want you to, to put on your critical thinking hats and I'm going to show you what the social science says about some of the probabilities of these things happening. So what, again, what I did was uh, every time I put together a, a set of ideas and called it a practice, I also was looking at what are the social scientists saying about this. And here is uh, a list or of, uh, some of the examples of some of the social scientists that I, that I looked at in each of the five practices. In general, I looked for uh, social scientists who were at the head of their field and who had a, a big perspective on, on what their field was saying about uh, probabilities that were gonna solve this problem. Uh, social science helps leaders to estimate various probabilities, like will our individual states put a price on carbon or will Texas invest significantly in its energy system uh, and so on. Um, in general, the social science suggests that in confronting climate change, cooperation is not likely to be strong enough and it's not likely to be fast enough. So uh, forgive me, but I wanna read these next few slides for emphasis. Um, and we're going to start with Daniel Kahneman, the, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics. And Kahneman tells us this, when it comes to rare probabilities, our mind is not designed to get things quite right. For the residents of a planet that may be exposed to events no one has yet experienced, this is not good news. And later in an interview, he said, I am deeply pessimistic. I really see no path to success on climate change. Now, he's a real micro guy. He says how we think and how we get our truth. Um, and Daniel Gilbert uh, at Harvard, uh, some, uh, the famous uh, host of NOVA, says, uh, <laughs> adds that a psychologist could barely dream up a better scenario for paralysis. Some other folks have done research about our altruism, something they call parochial altruism or tribalism, and how, how really badly tribal are we? And their conclusion is that whereas humans may have evolved the intuition to cooperate, it's unlikely such intuition brings world peace closer. Now, they weren't specifically talking about climate, they were just talking about macro issues. And um, uh, so it, it, the, the whole, the whole analysis of parochial altruism and tribalism is fascinating. How trusting are we? Uh, Charles Heckscher has said, um, it is possible to build trust based on collaborative purpose. This is difficult and not reliable. We are not likely to be able to get the nations of the world to work together on climate change or the reduction of inequality. Neither the needed attitudes nor the skills are widely enough distributed. In his book, he says that. Stan Cox has written a brilliant book on rationing. And one of the people he quotes there says, we have to reckon with the fact from 47 to 2008, we had a collision with affluence, we Americans, and it changed us as a people. It changed our political expectations. It changed us morally, and we lost a sense of discipline. Try to impose a carbon tax, and you'll notice that we've been failing to do that, let alone rationing today, and you'll hear moaning and groaning from all over. Uh, what can we learn from history? The, the famous geographer Jared Diamond says, Societies disintegrate mainly because of environmental problems. Now, some folks have disputed this, but not heavily. Um, and he says, societies fail to make the right decisions for a whole sequence of reasons, failure to anticipate a problem, failure to perceive it once it's arisen, failure to attempt to solve it after it's been perceived, and failure to succeed in attempts to solve it. Societies are not likely to recognize the problem in time and have been powerless to stop it. Um, a recent recently public, published book on global organizations like the UN um, concludes that most countries continue to have a strong incentive to avoid costly action on climate change, to wait for others to act and to negotiate for self-interested advantages. Cooperation problems continue to stymie effective global climate governments. Um, and some other folks there say there's gonna be a rocky road ahead and the stakes are whose life, way of life gets to survive. So all these folks uh, are pessimistic about our ability to cooperate. Now you can argue and you know, think about this, 
uh, that academics are always looking for problems. I said at the very beginning that I like to solve problems. So maybe all these folks are biased. Uh, you want to, and maybe, maybe cooperation will work. Um, who knows? It's up for, up for grabs. But um, if we believe that team humanity is, work, is weak on cooperation, then we as leaders need to pers persuade people that they must sacrifice. Uh, we need to help people let go of their tribalism and we need to develop plans that add up. So that is the task of leaders if they believe uh, that we're weak on cooperation and they want to address that problem. I want to argue to you that there's, there is good news out there and that cooperation is not the only thing way team humanity gets things done. Team humanity is also all these other things, wonderful, creative, intelligent, adventurous, com assertive, competitive, and our entrepreneur entrepreneurs in particular are innovative risk takers and so on. And so um, again, the main message is <clears throat> that team humanity needs to act fast. Our leaders must understand the big picture. Uh, we have to understand our strengths and weaknesses and we're fairly weak in cooperation Therefore, we, we sh maybe we should turn our talents uh, to our talents as entrepreneurs and innovators and place more bets on public and private innovation. Now, at this point, we come to the end of my capabilities as a, <clears throat> an organizational psychologist. Innovation is not my specialty. There's millions of people out there who know a whole lot about innovation. I, and if you are interested in helping um, maybe move away from the cooperative bias to, to what we could call an innovative bias, um, uh, to build a constituency for R&D and, uh, and D, the third, second D deployment. Um, I, I suggest that you take a look at the MIT Energy Initiative, uh, which has fantastic problem, uh, uh, programs online. I also suggest that you take a look at Bill Gates's new book. I think Bill Gates is pretty much saying um, that we must have innovation. He says it in a really nice way, but I think he is um, uh, uh, significantly promoting innovation as the way to save the planet. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I uh, want to thank you for listening. You can contact me anytime through my website, which is on the screen, and it's easy to remember, it's rayandre.com. I have there a guide for community discussions, uh, teaching materials, and um, a blog that, that updates my thinking from the book to, to, to uh, current situations. So back to you, Christine. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, so I do have a couple of questions that came in through the chat, and I will remind everyone that if they have any questions, they can add them to chat or they can unmute themselves and wait for me to call on you so we just don't have people talking over each other. Um, but I'll start with what came up through chat from the beginning. Um, so your very first comment and question came in uh, quite early and it reads, thank you for your mention of adoption. Growing overpopulation and our culture of eternal growth is overwhelming all else we do. Why are groups so often unwilling to mention the huge population connection? Well, you notice I didn't mention it very strongly because there's a taboo around, around telling people what to do with their families. And we've seen terrible situations in places like China where, you know, terrible repression of, of, um, of uh, families. And um, I don't have the answers to that. Uh, I do think it's a crucial problem. And I hope that people put it in their hearts and think about it. Uh, Senator Mike Barrett, you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to ask a question out loud? Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to thank you, Ray, for a, a fascinating talk and a, a terrific book, which I uh, own um, and uh, which you've tempted me to dip back into because you're you're hitting on some critical questions. Here's my question to you. Uh, what is the proper unit of cooperation? Uh, it's, it's one thing to engage with the challenges of cooperation within a community of 35,000 or so like Lexington uh, or our adjoining communities. It's another thing obviously to do, think about the state or the province as a unit, the national, when does cooperation start to break down? Uh, if, if we assume for the sake of argument that uh, getting all the countries of the world 
to work cooperatively is especially challenging because of the lack of an international governance structure that's 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 uh, that people have faith in that people have verified. That problem of legitimacy or authenticity is less right with a within a given country, even a large one like the United States or China, possibly even less again for a state or a local community. So, is this discouragement about cooperation one that is global, uh, and does it begin to attenuate? And are there glimmers of hope as you? Uh, move down the pyramid? Interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that with any authority, Mike. Um, it certainly feels like locally we can have more trust. And there is some research that suggests um, that people are more likely to trust their local government than, the, and, and, than they are to trust their state government than they are to trust their regional or national or international. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, so that would suggest that cooperation is more likely to work in the town than it is across countries. At the same time, uh, I think the notion, of tri the notion of tribalism and parochial altruism is very strong. And we see that play out in our towns and in our states and in our country. So um, if we don't address that directly by various means, such as you know, trying to get two sides together uh, in, in truth and in collegiality, um, we're still gonna have the problem at all levels. Can I just ask, uh, just elaborate on the question in one brief respect. Uh, it seems to me having observed some efforts to collaborate internationally, having attended a few of the, the conferences that are follow-ons to Paris, that uh, I'm gonna overstate it, but you could almost say that we are hardwired at this point as a culture to believe in the nation state, in this case, our own, to believe in state governments because we accept them as part of the infrastructure and to believe in our individual towns. It's very hard to get people to accept new models that they're not acculturated to accepting. And that would include the United Nations and international cooperation. It also uh, would include regional cooperation across states within the United States. So there is some, there is some hope, I think, for the portions of, uh, the portions of self-governance that are, that are accepted by the culture in which we live, the nation state, the province or the state, the individual community, it could be that international governance is an especially hard nut to crack. You're probably right. I, I don't have data on that. Um, and Mike, you've obviously studied this a lot and this is why we follow you. Well, I, I think I, I, I owe you a great deal of uh, for the inspiration, Ray. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Mike. There was a comment in the chat. One more, say one more thing about that. And so I, I think that um, there's hope for cooperation and change as people and, and getting people to adopt new paradigms as, as you say you have studied. The problem is we're innovating. We, we have a deadline here. We've got to, we've got to solve this problem quickly. And people learn and change very slowly, right? And they're pulled, they're pulled by their very, um, biological selves. And so I think that's why now I would like to see more money in innovation now, because that that can really take hold. Uh, whereas changing people's tribalism, you know, may take generations. So I think this question maybe ties into it. Um, I don't remember exactly at what point in the presentation it came in, but the question is, what about the economic financial system, power inequalities, rampant consumerism, et cetera? You know, I think that the financial system is one thing that I don't cover very well in my book. I point to it here and there. And I, uh, I really think that uh, there's a lot going on. If you read the Financial Times, uh, which is one of the best sources on energy and especially energy, obviously, and, and money issues. Um, there's a tremendous amount going on over there. 
Locally, we have the organization series, which is uh, very much uh, oriented to the business uh, community and the economics of all of this. Um, I attended their conference last time it was live here in Boston. It is fantastic. You can learn an awful lot through that organization. So a little bit of a different direction in this next question. At an interfaith power and light, I heard a civil rights leader from 30 years ago draw parallels in the role of the church and morality in mobilizing people for a cause. What do you think about that? Uh, <laughs> my church or not, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I do think that, um, uh, I think first of all, we have to mend our democracy and that's for all churches and all faiths. And so that all, all perspectives are welcome. And then beyond that, I do think that, again, as I said before, the people that tend to be interested in my work uh, in, in, in promoting strong sustainability as opposed to weak sustainability tend to be mission-driven schools, whatever their mission is. Um, so Wendy asks, if innovation and entrepreneurship are the best means to fight climate change, what elements need to be in place or require funding or are we talking about private enterprise acting, not based on altruism, but on a profit motive? All of, all of the above. And again, I'm not an expert in that. And I would just orient you to uh, Bill Gates's new book or go online and, and, and just read a few of the, some of the stuff that, that MIT is, is publishing. Um, it really wouldn't be fair for me to comment broadly on that. Um, there are a few other comments. Uh, there's. Uh, quite a discussion going on in chat around um, both the economic and financial impact or factors as well as the um, question of overpopulation. So um, I, I'm not necessarily going to start the, you know, I'm not going to read all of those comments, but people are welcome to look in the chat and, and have that discussion and I can save the chat and share that with everybody afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, in a minute, we will go into breakout rooms and I think the smaller discussions may generate some more questions or, or may just um, bring out some more comments that are worth sharing with everyone. I do want to shamelessly promote the library in terms of some additional resources for all of you. Um, we do have quite a few databases in our online resources uh, area of the website. So if anybody's interested in seeing what kinds of science or economic journals we have access to, you can get those with a Minuteman library card, no charge. A lot of times you can get full text and save the PDF. So um, there are some resources for additional research and information if you're interested. Um, I will um, move people into breakout rooms now. I will start by asking for your patience as I do this because Zoom has slightly changed the format of the breakout room assignment. So forgive me if it takes a little bit longer than you may have expected it to. Um, and for the facilitators, we have seven um, groups and we have 44 participants. So I'm going to do the math for you so that you know when you have everybody in your group. Most of you will have six people. So when you get to six in your group, um, you can start. And um, I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, this is Christine from the library. And I've uh, spotlighted Ray so that she can maybe give us a first summary of how her discussion group went. Um, we will have an opportunity for people to ask additional questions. So you can put those in chat if you want. Um, but while we're seeing if any other questions come in, we'll, we'll just sort of summarize those discussion groups. Um, and we have about 15 minutes to do that. So, so Ray, you wanna talk about your group first? Gosh, um, you know, we have some discouragement that, uh, you know, we haven't changed enough in the last, you know, 50 years, uh, despite our you know, attempting to do so in our generation, uh, and that resilience is the, is the answer. Um, I think people are 
wondering, you know, how, uh, how we can implement uh, more emphasis on innovation as individuals. And we discussed, you know, do we need a movement for innovation? It seems like such a strange thing to be supporting innovators. Um, but yet, if we really do need to improve the R&D monies and support from government, I do think our government representatives need to hear from us. I'm thinking mostly about federal because I don't know enough about innovation at the state level. But so the question is, you know, a very interesting question that I think was posed and we didn't answer it is, you know, how can the public help uh, improve the climate for innovation in the country? Excellent. Um, if we have any other facilitators who want to share their uh, group discussion or add something else, you can unmute yourself um, and, and you can, Fran, uh, why don't I, hopefully it's okay if I bring you up here with Ray. Um, do you wanna talk about what your group discussed? Sure. Yeah, I, th I think we, we didn't quite buy the lack of cooperation across the board. What we like to think of is that we had examples of cooperation and of innovation, both. And uh, one of the examples that came up was the, um, the climate roadmap bill that's being discussed now on Beacon Hill. Uh, it's gone back and forth from the, the uh, uh, legislature to the governor and back to the legislature. And now we were lucky enough to have um, Senator Mike Barrett in our group and he was saying, we really need to reach out to our legislators right now, especially those outside our district. So if you send something to five friends who are not in Lexington um, and urge them to get to their legislators and tell them to hold firm on the really important parts of this bill rather than let the governor weaken them, that's what we need. Uh, and I, I would see that that is a good, co a good example of cooperation among a lot of people who are interested in moving this forward and innovation, which will ultimately come in order for us to reach our climate goals. So Excellent. hopeful. Hope is good. Jean, I see that you are um, unmuted. So I'm gonna add you up on screen. And if you wanna share um, what your group discussed. Um, I, I'll try. Um, we felt that you can take advantage of competition, and in fact, we are taking advantage of competition in a, in a variety, of, variety of ways in order to um, advance progress. Um, taking advantage of, of people competing for new technologies, as well as sort of um, entities and small groups competing to see who can, can achieve the, the greatest change the fastest. Um, we also, I think, um, recognize that it, it, in the course of doing that, we're also being somewhat in, innovative, um, that there's probably more areas in which innovation has to occur, um, particularly at the global level. Um, and an example of that that, we, that came up was in terms of, of, global, of, of financing, you know, if the, um, in order to kind of um, be certain that we incentivize only projects that um, are sustainable, uh, that we would be able to um, spread the wealth more among poor nations and, and wealthy, wealthy nations. Um, I'm trying to look to check my, my notes, but um, the feeling was that uh, we are in using innovation both at the local level and at the national level in order to um, achieve change. And um, we are not gonna be successful if we rely solely on cooperation. Thank you. Um, I have a, a hand raised from Roger. So I'm gonna assume it's a question for Ray. So I'm gonna bring Ray back to the screen. And Roger, if you want to unmute yourself, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Um, I just, uh, Ray, if you would address the issue that I've been thinking about, which is that I see the key obstacle to achieving our the necessary goals we have for the 
for stopping climate change as being political, that, it, that actually most of humanity is or will be on, on the right side of this issue. And the reason they're not is because we've been lied to for 50 years. By, and and the, the people who are the obstacle are, are actually a very small number. They just happen to have a lot of money and a lot of power and namely the fossil fuel industry, which is losing its power now, but it's trying hard to hang on and to, and has a lot of politicians, especially in this country, in its pocket. And as Bill McKibben says, our primary task is to defeat the political power of the fossil fuel industry. That's how we win this fight. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. I think you're dead on and, um... You know, as I said early in the presentation, you know, we have to do this through democracy and we have to fight like hell to keep our democracy strong so that we can, um, and so that we can um, reduce the power of corporations in our decision-making. Absolutely has to happen. And, you know, one of the things, that, you know, a lot of times students of mine think, oh, you know, I'm going to take this course, I'm going to become a sustainability director. And I'm like, no, 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 uh, you know, go become a state legislator uh, or, you know, or I don't know, start your own company. You're still going to have a major role to play. And there might be even more important things than, than becoming a, a, a sustainability director. And one of those things might be, you know, dedicating yourself to government, for example. Marsha, I see your hand up. Would you like to add something? Um, very interesting conversation in my group, um, starting with uh, someone who had a long history in business and felt that discouraged that it never, we had never seen uh, attention in the midst of the hurly burly of business paid to sustainability. Um, but then within the same group, I had a very interesting uh, observation from someone who spent time uh, in Hong Kong observing how changes in banking and, be, and being lended money for uh, projects could be influencing people's, uh, if they have a good environmental scorecard and carbon scorecard. So that's one place where um, I, it's a for, the form of regulation through banking is encouraging innovation um, and also um, how, again, within banking, the ESG reporting is putting money towards um, for people to be in the market. They need to be reporting on their environmental, social, and governance parameters. So within business, that is one aspect of, of setting standards um, and perhaps forms of regulation that can um, move the bar and, and create innovation. Thank you. Um, so we've hit 8.30, which is what we were scheduled to go to, but I'm happy to uh, continue this so that we can get a summary from the different groups that met. Um, but if people have to go, I understand your, your plan might have been to stay until 8.30, so that's fine. Um, hi, Anne, I am going to add you to the screen and you can summarize your group for us. You're mute. Uh, no, you are unmuted. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> in our group, I would say that we um, sort of sided more on the side of we did not underestimate humanity's ability to cooperate. And um, but we also, I think, pointed out that maybe innovation leads to greater cooperation. Um, someone brought up the Montreal Protocol as being an example of humanity's ability to cooperate, although given, you know, the solution there was more obvious um, and there were technological uh, solutions, alternatives to the problem. And, um, and we talked more about what we as individual citizens can do to um, uh, innovate, to help move innovation along. And um, some ideas were to involve more young people in the discussion that uh, other people tend to listen more when young people are sort of in the fight. 
and uh, that we could mobilize locally on maybe a town level, for example, through like bans, like if you were to ban plastics, for example, then that spurs businesses to have to innovate and come up with other ways to deliver their products. Um, and then of course, also taking political action. And, um, and then of course, on an individual level, thinking of the common good and changing our lifestyles, like, you know, examining our own carbon footprint and seeing where we can change what we're doing. Excellent. Fran, I'm gonna bring you up um, if you wanna summarize what your group discussed. Actually, I already did. You did, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're just still unmuted, I'm sorry. How about Ricky? I'll add Ricky to the mix. Oh, the uh, menu keeps moving on me. My apologies. There we go. <laughs> um, we had, uh, we talked a lot about um, political, um, the, the role of politics and, and how that plays into whether we can be optimistic or not optimistic, um, especially now if we're talking about our country and how the, it, everything is so polar right now. Um, and wherever one group goes, the other group goes against it and how we, um, how we can make that work for us, um, you know, switch that around because that whole dialogue makes movement and change very, very difficult. We also came up with um, the Montreal solution. That was one time when team humanity came together and said, this is a big problem, we need to solve it. And they did, it, and pretty quickly when you think back over it. Um, so why did that work? And I agree that there was technical sol technology um, solutions that allowed us to replace one thing with another thing. And, and um, but boy, Mother Earth sure responded to that solution. So, um, maybe we can rustle up some of that energy that allowed us to, to do that um, and band together. Um, and possibly, you know, putting a price on carbon, um, certainly um, working towards um, Senator Barrett's bill a, as a solution. Um, you know, those are some of the things that are available to us in Massachusetts. And we can choose to, to set, set some kind of team humanity um, solutions that, that other people can follow, but at least we can do in our state and sometimes lead by example. Sure. Roseanne, would you like to come up and summarize your discussion? And I think if I counted right, you would be the last of the uh, facilitators. <laughs> um, my apologies. I also am seeing that Zoom is now letting me have more than just two people on camera. So I'm a little distracted by how exciting that is to me <laughs> as a program host. <laughs> so, um, but after uh, Roseanne, if you want to summarize your discussion, then uh, we can wrap things up and, and leave some opportunities for people to continue the discussion. Sure. So there was some conversation around the cooperation piece being difficult when it comes to cross generations. So I thought that was interesting, especially when our policymakers don't necessarily reflect the age diversity of the country and that can cause cooperation challenges. So there's the age piece to the generational piece and then there was also the geographical piece brought up around the country where it's more difficult to cooperate with certain states when it comes to climate change. With respect to the competitive nature, you know, it's utilizing a strength of humanity and that natural increase in competitiveness around sustainability, you know, there's mention of all the different electric vehicles that are coming out now, that kind of creates a cycle of innovation and can spur that innovation. So that's a way that that competitive nature can help. Another thought that came up was, you know, can the competitiveness be used in, with respect to the Paris Agreement or the next version of that? 
And then with respect to promoting innovation, you know, pushing leaders to reward people who are engaging in innovation more, purchasing innovative products, right? Consumers have more power than we think when it comes to this. And when we buy something that sends a signal back to companies that this is what we want more of. And then that piece of, you know, demonstrating innovation more within ourselves at our own homes, the whole reduce, reuse, recycle, and then among our peers as well. So using, utilizing that as well. Thanks, Christine. Uh, thank you. Um, Ray, any final thoughts or words that you'd like to share? Well, thank you so much for a really interesting discussion. I know these concepts are kind of in kind of large <laughs> and hard to get our arms around, but I do think uh, considering the difference between uh, cooperation and competition, pretty well supported in the social science and that uh, I think a lot of the ideas you guys had were great about how to how to obviously we have to work with both right you don't innovate without having people cooperate so you have to go in both directions so thank you so much for the opportunity to share my work and and uh, hear and hear your reactions I, I hope to learn from it I, I just want to say um, thank you to you Ray for um, for bringing your work to us and for doing this presentation. And thank you to all of the facilitators and GWAC for partnering with us. Um, I read your book before the program. And for me, the most interesting part was the, the social science and the organizational psychology. And it'll be interesting to see, um, I mean, I think the hard science has been out there for a while and it'll be interesting to see how a different perspective on climate change you know, maybe makes a difference or enables people to act differently, just in terms of thinking about how people make a decision to act and how they make a decision to take a leadership role in something. So it will be interesting to watch what happens. Um, I want to thank our audience who everybody who's still left with us tonight. Um, thank you for participating in the small group discussions and staying with us until the end. I will put this recording up on YouTube, um, hopefully this evening, and I will send you all a link to it. I will also send you um, a feedback survey. I would love to know what you thought about tonight's program, but also what other kinds of programs you'd like to see us offer. So if this spurred any ideas for something else that the library can bring to the town, we would be happy to hear about that. So please use the survey to do that. And, um, I'll just say thank you again to everyone and have a great night. <laughs>